Hey friends, these are the books that I use for the eight games that I am currently running as a professional DM. And yet, I've still got tons of books on my shelf that I have never run. Sound familiar? Those adventures on the shelf might feel useless, but they're not. Because there are hidden gems tucked away in each of them that can help us with the campaigns that we're currently running, even when you're not running that particular story. Today I'll share seven of them, tell you some exciting news for the channel, and give you a bonus tip at the end that includes a downloadable resource to improve your wilderness encounters one D100 at a time. Ready? Let's get to it. Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus. While you might think that it's going to center around the happenings in Baldur's Gate and that we might be talking about the awesome gazetteer that's included for that particular location, actually the tips that we get today are about law and chaos. We're going to start with the legalese before we move on to inject a little bit of chaos into our games. Appendix A of Baldur's Gate includes diabolical deals, which though they are about the devil in the details kind of deals that happen between infernal creatures and hapless mortals gives us a framework that we can use for any kind of contracts in our games, including ideas on how people could find loopholes that were purposefully or accidentally placed into contracts, and how you could go about the negotiation process. It gives you ideas for fantastic ways that contracts could be recorded, what kind of penalties could happen for breaking them, and it serves as an awesome framework not just for devil's deals, but also for deals with other planar entities. There could be deals with jinn or warlock patrons or deities that are taking place actively in our campaigns or in the backstories of our characters that could have consequences for how they are able to portray their characters. It could be a major quest to try and fulfill the clause that allows them to get out of a contract and these diabolical deals get, come with all sorts of suggestions on how much you should be able to give depending upon the power level relatively of the creatures involved and that allows you to transfer it from the devilish deals that it's set up to to pretty much any kind of contract that you can imagine. This could even be set up as an adventuring contract by some kind of adventuring guild that was sending you out on different missions and thus had consequences consequences for failure or just as a way to magically enforce the contract for those that are on the receiving end of the bounty. Utilizing these deals in ways other than just as a devil's temptation gives you a lot of opportunities to present different things at the table from this one little Appendix A. Some of these creatures are masters of deception and so it pays for your adventurers to be careful so that they don't end up with their souls on the black market. Speaking of the black market, did you know that there is a black market out there for pretty much all of the information that you would rather keep to yourself? My exciting news for the channel is that we have our very first sponsor, Aura, who is kind of like the non-detection spell for internet and phone privacy and protection. I've had my personal financial information stolen before. Phone bills in the hundreds and credit card attempts to hire escort services were just two of the fun happenstances to come out of that day. Luckily, I was with my wife when the escort services were charged, otherwise I might not be here in order to talk to you today. Once the information is out there though, it takes more skill than an expert rogue to get it back under control. Your full name, email, home address, health records, relatives, it's all for sale, sold to scammers and spammers and anyone else who might want to target you. A quick search on Google tells us that there are still people selling our information for anyone who wants to buy it, and I can't tell you how uncomfortable that makes me. Which is why my wife and I have been using Aura. As soon as we signed up, they found 16 different data brokers that were selling my information back and forth around the country. And just as immediately, they went to work on opting out. Cleaning up my online presence not only helps to reduce the amount of spam that I receive, but it protects me from hackers who might try and hijack this channel, my bank account, or other sensitive information. 
We had Aura set up in no time since you don't have to download a bunch of different apps and though it is true that we already had some services protecting one or another different portion of our identity, casting Arcane Lock on the front door doesn't really help you all that much if you leave the back door to the dungeon wide open for adventurers to plunder. With Aura we take care of things like antivirus, VPNs, password management, parental controls, identity theft, insurance, or other services. And and they send us a weekly email letting us know what they're doing to protect us from danger that might be out there. My family values their privacy, and I'm sure that yours does too. If you're looking to cast non-detection on your private information, you can go to aura.com slash dmtimothy and get a two-week free trial. Give it a try, and I'm sure you'll want that temporary non-detection to become a permanent Aura. But while Aura is keeping your data safe and orderly, there's still that injection of chaos we were going to talk about. On page 78 of the Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus book, there's a neat little table with some simple rules that can easily be slipped past when you're running this campaign, but are great for injecting chaos into all sorts of situations. It's the Demon Icker table with the properties of flesh warping. If you're running it by the book, then contact with Demon Icker causes creatures other than fiends, oozes, plants, and undead to make a DC 10 constitution saving throw to resist the flesh warping nature of Demon Icker. If you fail on that check, then you have to roll on the flesh warping table as your body is mutated in one way or another. Everything from having your ears fly off without your body attached to having bulging lamplight eyes that shine forth into the darkness is on the table along with a bunch of others, many of which are detrimental, some of which are beneficial, and some that kind of feel a little bit like both. I've injected chaos into my other campaigns by utilizing this same table for places like potion testing or the warping effects of the Far Realm. I've used it for contact with Primordial Ooze and for opportunities for mutation wherever they might rise in my game. You can change or add to the list from any source that you might desire, including, of course, your own imagination. Pages 10 and 11 of the Icewind Dale Rime of the Frost Maiden book include some additional detail on how to handle wilderness travel and encounters and environmental hazards that take place out in the frozen tundra. Rules for avalanches, blizzards, veering off course, extreme cold, and the effect of frigid water, as well as a much harsher take on the impacts of snow and ice on travel over land, are just a rough synopsis of the rules that you can pick up out of your Icewind Dale adventure book to utilize in your own frozen campaign, regardless of where that might be in the world. One unfortunate lack in Icewind Dale was a more structured means of figuring out your travel distances and your location. But to be honest, it's Tomb of Annihilation that's going to give us the masterclass on that. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but first up, let's bring the world to life with some much needed flavor from Curse of Straw. Page seven of Curse of Straw includes the Marks of Horror, which might seem like something that you would only ever use if you're running a Ravenloft or horror-themed campaign, but in actuality includes some excellent advice on the narration of your world and the foreshadowing of threats and dangers that are to come that you can use in pretty much any campaign and that is lacking from teachings that are included in the Dungeon Master's Guide or pretty much anywhere else. Though this is probably one of the hardest pages to potentially twist to be usable in your own campaign, I think it might be one of the most valuable. By taking a close look at this and learning about personification, foreshadowing, about the use of age, light, detail, or humor and the unknown in order order to enhance your gameplay, you can find ways by twisting these and adjusting the items to match your campaign world that you can create greater tension at the table when you're trying to create it and set a better scene. There are of course other ways to create worry about what might be following us other than just what's included in Curse of Strahd. In fact, Out of the Abyss includes some great rules to help us do just that. But first, let's talk about the world that you are foreshadowing. 
at least if you're doing so in the Forgotten Realms. Because if you're running your game in the Forgotten Realms, Storm King's Thunder is probably the most useful book that you could have on your shelf. Chapter 3, which clocks in at almost 60 pages in weight, is essentially a gazetteer of the Forgotten Realms, Frozen North, and Savage Frontier. It includes details on everything from Ten Towns to Waterdeep, and from Anorak in the east to the Purple Rocks out in the Trackless Sea. Unlike the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, which also includes some snippets of information about these locations, the Storm King's Thunder goes one step further by providing quest hooks and pieces of information that tie the world together and give you an easy means of looking for information about those locations. By taking a quick peek at where your adventurers are about to be and then creating rumors from the locations that are nearest on the provided map, you can simply and easily tie your world together into something that feels real and valuable and alive. Though the adventure hooks that are in here are largely designed around the Storm King's Thunder story of giants in upheaval, you can easily change that to another theme while still keeping the basics intact. The biggest advantage that we have of running games in the Forgotten Realms is the vast amount of lore and history that has already taken place, but the biggest detriment is that putting that into a bite-sized package that we can then deliver to our players becomes a challenge of time and the amount of information we have to pull from. The third chapter in here does the trick for us of pulling that information together and a quick Google search and a entry on fandom can provide additional details to flesh out those things that your players show interest in without you having to do all of the research up front. With the Storm King's Thunder and the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide in hand, you pretty much can't go wrong if you are playing in the less forgotten portion of the Forgotten Realms. If you're looking to provide some form of hunt in your campaign, perhaps your players being hunted or your players hunting someone, then Out of the Abyss, page 24, has some great rules that can be a real addition to your campaign. Unlike the rules presented in the Player's Handbook or the Dungeon Master's Guide, these aren't strictly a matter of comparing speeds against one another and occasionally rolling a survival check, but instead are a more in-depth set of rules on how you can track a pursuit level to where you can ingeniously and easily describe whether or not somebody is getting closer or further away based on the kind of things that are happening in your adventurer's day. If they're traveling faster, then they gather more distance, but perhaps leave easier tracks to follow. If they're traveling slower, then you're going to catch up on them, though they are able to navigate more easily. By having these little comparisons and working on this, you can create a tense tracking encounter where your players are trying to escape from a more powerful foe, and it gives you an easy framework to use for any kind of encounter that might run in this kind of fashion. Page 31 is kind of just a bonus point in this, in that it gives you some advice on how to quickly summarize travel. It gives you the option of leaning into collaborative storytelling telling if that's the kind of thing you enjoy at your table and that your players enjoy by allowing you to offer some narrative control to your players as to what kind of things have happened over the course of several days while you're summarizing travel. It essentially allows you to utilize fireside encounters that aren't necessarily actually fireside and if you've got NPCs along for the ride it gives you some advice on how to include them in that discussion. Tomb of Annihilation is the source of both both our seventh tool and our bonus. Despite the DMG's advice on how to map using hexes, it includes pretty much no direct advice on how to actually run those hexes in a way that is satisfying for your players. Meanwhile, the Tomb of Annihilation includes just that. On page 37, where the expedition begins, it gives you discreet and implicit advice on how to utilize the attached hex map and how to help players to identify 
where they're starting and determine their directions, how to help figure out whether or not they're lost, when dice should be open or hidden, and how to determine what kind of random complications might in be included on any given hex. While Tomb of Annihilation doesn't go the full route of including something of interest on every single hex, it does go so far as to have an included handout that has a lot of empty space of hexes so that your players can record for themselves what they find and can gain that sense of discovery as they slowly fill in the map while searching for their eventual goal. It's pretty easy to port this advice over into your own campaigns and if you've created some kind of a map then you can give that to your players or if you haven't fully created your map yet give them a starting point and build yourself out from where they are and let them slowly discover as you slowly create. Either way, utilizing the hex scroll advice in here on how to track distances, how much travel can be done in different terrains, and how navigation takes place can allow you to create a fun wilderness hex crawl exploration without having to make too much up for yourself. But our bonus tip from Tomb of Annihilation is actually in the random encounters. This section tucked away in the back of this book is probably my favorite random encounter table of all time, simply because of just how detailed it is and how easily it's able to be slotted into any campaign in order to create something of great interest. It will take you a little bit of time to create a full list of this many ideas as to the kinds of encounters that can be encountered in your terrain, but having a different D100 list for all the different kinds of terrain that could be found in your fantasy world creates an awesome opportunity for you to outsource your randomization of what might be present to a handy table. And so I've created a quick template for you to be able to fill out that has all of the percentile chances for different things being created, including in no danger, low danger, or high danger areas is so that you can slot them into your campaign, whether you're running Forgotten Realms, Eberron, or a homebrew world of your own. This doesn't have to be defined by a jungle and can be taken anywhere that it might be useful to you. Hopefully, it'll be something that you'll find valuable at your table. You can go ahead and pick up your encounter table by clicking on this link up here. Thanks so much for watching and happy adventuring.